You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. <laughs> For the very last of the resistance. We need Luke Skywalker. I'm not coming back. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only help. That was a cheap move. We need you to bring the Jedi back. Kylo Ren is strong with the Force. What do you know about the Force? It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sentence was wrong. Ah, Skywalker. Missed you, have I. (laughs) Oh, they hate that ship! Rebellion is reborn. The war is just beginning. And I will not be the last Jedi. Hi, everybody, and welcome once again to Geek Fest Rants. My name is Carlos Perone. And today we are delving into Star Wars again, and we are specifically going into that subject that I keep saying to myself I am done talking about, but apparently I'm not, and that is The Last Jedi. What we're going to do today is we're going to examine the script to see if there's any ways of sprucing it up, making it a little better, making it work for the people that it has not worked for. I guess it's what people do when they do different passes at a script. You know, third draft, fourth, fifth draft. You bring somebody in to punch in the script, to tweak it, to, you know, to, to mess with it a little bit, to make it a little more coherent. That is the exercise we're going to be doing. This episode turned out to be longer than expected because there is just so many things that could have been done that were not. And we'll see what happens. So let's get started with the revised The Last Jedi script. What did I teach you? You are the Duke of New York. You are a number one. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Can you dig it? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That horn of Satan. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> the Force will be with you, always. Well, today we're going to take a look at the Star Wars Last Jedi script in terms of was there a way to possibly have worked the script out a little better in order for it to be a more satisfying film? Now, you know, full disclosure as usual here, I am one of those that were not very happy with that film, as opposed to a big chunk of people that were pretty happy with it. It seems to me that the breakdown might fall somewhere about 50-50, let's say. I don't know for sure. But what I want to strip away completely from this particular examination is the reasons. In other words, we've already talked about in previous episode that there are many different reasons why certain people like or disliked that particular chapter of this trilogy. So I'm not getting into that. In other words, we've talked about it before. There are people that are just haters and they're going to, you know, as they say, haters are going to hate. 
However, there's always been this tradition, you know, especially with sci-fi fans and genre fans, you know, that kind of thing. And Star Wars fans. Star Wars fans love to take information and pick it apart as much as humanly possible and theorize on these things. Well, that's what we're doing here today. We're going to take a certain storyline and we're going to see if there is a way of rewriting it so that it makes more sense. Now, granted, this is not one of these crazy fanboy things where they're collecting money and they're doing a some kind of a write-in campaign to reshoot the I mean reshoot the film and you know by, by the time this airs that whole thing might have gone out the window which is completely and utterly ridiculous as far as I'm concerned because again one thing is just talking about well from a story perspective if somebody handed you this script and said here what do you think of this you know my reaction i don't have experience in reading scripts and punching up scripts and being able to tell a good from a bad script if i if i had that talent i would be making millions of dollars somewhere else but if you know for somebody who's a critical thinker and who likes to pick apart these stories and you know just like we did with just about everything you know we we criticized all the films where it needed to be criticized and granted it used to be an exercise in creativity that's really all it used to be and it's the type of thing that would kind of uh, lead you to be able to be a little more creative in the way you write or the way you read things you know what things make sense and what things don't make sense can you kind of catch it in the writing before it actually makes it to film but these types of exercises have happened all the time, all the way back to the, uh, you know, to the original trilogy. Uh, you know, once Star Wars got out of the gate, we started to examine just about everything. People were examining, oh, we got Boba Fett, but we really didn't do much with him. You know, okay, it didn't turn into a major, <laughs> you know, front page story for regular news. It was just fan analyzing a film critically. It happened even more during the prequels, obviously, if, you know, people were not very happy sometimes with the decisions Lucas made, and neither was I. There were cer certain points of the of these films that are like, oh, this is just, just a, this a bad decision or a bad scene or or a, a little too kitty jokey kind of, you know, things that all of a sudden we were treating it in a similar manner in the way that I'm kind of treating The Last Jedi is that overall... You know, the story gets you where you want to go. It gets us to a point of where we want to be, let's say. However, the details is what's troubling. The details on how we got there is very troubling. So what I have here is a way to analyze the film and a way to suggest certain plot point differences that could adjust for the film. So in other words, I'm not saying you have to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater you know you have to completely destroy this uh, in order to create something new which ironically it is the message of <laughs> the last jedi which was not the message of a force awakens and definitely not the message of earlier films that you have to kill the past completely i'll say it again you're dealing with a trilogy you do not reinvent the wheel halfway through a trilogy if the first film was a complete failure disaster you would kind of say, well, maybe, yeah, maybe you, you, you have to kind of rewrite this because it is obviously not working. The fans are not on your side. The money might not be on your side to reflect that. So, you know, that's, that's what happened. But here, what you're dealing with is a mid-trilogy readjustment where they are literally rewriting the rules. There is no consistency in the goal. Even if there was consistency in the goal, getting there is just as important. You cannot just kind of do a 180 and then end up in the same location. You know, it's very, very difficult to not feel like somebody just went completely in a different place. There is a place for that sort of thing. I mentioned it many times before. You want to experiment and do something different? You can do it. Do it with a standalone film. Do it with a new trilogy. But don't mess up this trilogy that you just started for the sake of trying something new. And by trying something new, I'm not talking about introducing a new character here or there. I'm talking about really, really messing with your original characters, really messing with the perceived intent of the first chapter of this particular trilogy. Now, 
even though Last Jedi was the most divisive one so far, and I still don't buy the idea that the money justifies the reaction. No, I have a feel, I, you know, I think that part of what's happening with the money is what we're seeing now with Solo. Solo is a reactionary kind of film in terms of how the money is reacting to it. Aside from the overwhelming bad timing of when they put out Solo, there is a percentage, I would imagine, there is a certain chunk, I don't think it's huge, but it is a capturable amount that has to do with this reaction to this film. However, The Force Awakens had its share of problems as far as fan critical reaction. And just like in The Last Jedi, when you strip away the crazy, racist, hater, troll reaction, you know, to that initial film, and you're left with just plain cinematic analysis and critical analysis of the film, one of the things that people mentioned, and, and it did happen back then. I re clearly remember it, and, and it is there. It is noticeable, but you kind of go with it a little bit, uh, at least most of the way, is that The Force Awakens follows certain beats that we had seen before, specifically in A New Hope. The Last Jedi, on the other hand, follows other beats that are more significant in The Empire Strikes Back and in Return of the Jedi. Now, for The Force Awakens, you know, when you think about it, you do have a lead character, who's Rey, who's an orphan, who lives out in a, in a desert planet, you know, very isolated from everybody else. And in A New Hope, you have Luke, who is also an orphan and lives out in a sand planet, <laughs> very isolated from everyone else. Now, this isn't coincidences. These are not coincidences. I'm pretty sure that the intent, at least originally, because things are changing, the intent was to try to bring people back to the original trilogy feel, not only in the look of things, but in the way that we were used to seeing the story progressed. So the fact that there are so many callbacks, so many mirror type of story structure events, it was done by design. It wasn't, it's not just an accident or coincidence. In The Force Awakens, you have you know, everybody in this planet and, and in certain regions, you know, people are living under this oppressed first order. You know, they're not as shocked as other people to see them. Granted, in the storyline, it's kind of like, oh, they're here. You know, they're at least for the resistance. They're like surprised that these people are around. Oh, my God, it's been confirmed they're around. But it seems that for some of these planets, they're kind of used to them already. So they've been seeing them already and they're already, you know, feeling somewhat oppressed by them. In A New Hope, you have the Empire. And again, everybody knows the Empire, and they're all under their thumb. Your lead character in The Force Awakens, one of the lead characters, once again, Rey, you know, we find out through the film that she is somewhat Force-sensitive. And by the end of the film, we kind of find that her Force uh, sensitivity helps her quite a bit in her lightsaber skills and, and you know, being able to, to fight off other individuals, including another big force-wielding individual. New Hope, once again, we have Luke, who is, out of the blue, a very force-sensitive individual. You know, we find out along the way, once again, as he's little by little learning, you know, about his powers, his untapped powers. We get a little more of that during Empire Strikes Back. You know, how much power can he get? How much... How little training really he requires to be able to get to a certain level. But even here, it's happening too. As we later find, you know, for different reasons, you know, Luke does get to train with Yoda. Luke does get some minimal training with Obi-Wan. Rey, on the other hand, gets very little training to begin with. But it is implied through some of the additional materials that just her exposure to Kylo Ren lets her kind of absorb his... Not necessarily his powers, but her ability to learn some of these powers. Uh, she doesn't just suck your powers, you know, dry. She becomes knowledgeable in how to obtain those powers. Let's put it that way. Force Awakens, you also have Bray, who through a good chunk of the film, she has a particular mission of protecting a droid that she found. She's trying to get this droid back to its proper owner, 
Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, same thing. He comes upon these droids and he's trying to return them, uh, you know, back to the person that owns them. Both these droids on both sides uh, have just escaped from some major battle or major skirmish. And they are kind of like on the run, you know, by the time both these characters find them. The big bad guy secret weapon, if you will, is similar. You have, you know, for Ray, you have the planet killer, you know, this monster sized gun built into the planet that absorbs the power from the local sun and then uses it to trigger and to power the gun to blow up not just another planet, but entire systems. An entire system he could hit. It could hit a whole bunch of planets in one shot. With Star Wars, the original, obviously you had the Death Star, you know, a completely artificially made space station, you know, moon size that could fire upon other planets and destroy them. So you do have that returning, you know, to the big gun scenario, uh, which was already repeated once during Return of the Jedi, which was another critical point that people, you know, when, when, when you try to analyze Return of the Jedi, that was probably something that could have been done a little better. You know, if you're going to create a new bad guy weapon, don't just make it, you know, part two of whatever the first one was. Well, it's just a little bigger. Yeah, okay, I get it. You know, it's just, yeah, it's realistic. Yeah, you, you could figure that they, whatever the weapon is, they're creating another one, you know, a secondary one somewhere. That's, that's perfectly acceptable, but... Not very creative, if you think about it, for, for entertainment purposes, not for reality. And again, this isn't even reality. We're dealing in fantasy. But, I don't know, you figure they would have done something a little different. Your lead character also has help from what would become secondary, you know, or, or, or secondary primary characters, if you will. Co-stars, co-leads, you know. With Ray, you have Finn. He is the co-star, and he is kind of like her support system in this first film, The Force Awakens. And with Star Wars, you have Han Solo and, to a certain extent, Chewbacca. They're, you know, they're kind of like a pair, and they kind of supplement Luke. You know, Luke is the naive young guy, and Solo is the a little more wise street savvy kind of individual that helps him he has a different role than obi-wan definitely going back to the super weapon of the particular films in the force awakens you have a super weapon that is about to be used in public so whoever is you know whatever bad guy is in charge of this weapon there you're you're witnessing it at a point where they're about to unveil it you know for the public to see to intimidate whoever it is that you're trying to intimidate. And the same thing happens on Star Wars. You have the Death Star, and this is the first time that they're going to use it to completely obliterate an entire planet. Granted, on Rogue One, we do get to see uh, them testing it out in a smaller scale, but not to the extreme that you see it at this point. In The Force Awakens, you have our heroes visiting Maskatana's castle, which is a throwback to Star Wars of visiting the cantina. This is an opportunity in a film to be able to see a whole bunch of weird alien creatures, which is what happens in Star Wars. Again, you're, you're trying to recreate that Star Wars-y feel, you know, as you're introducing these new trilogies. In the structure of The Force Awakens, you have Finn on a mission at a certain point to try to rescue Rey. Now, granted, she doesn't really need much rescuing. She can take care of herself, which is ironic because in Star Wars, Luke and Ben and Solo eventually end up trying to rescue the princess. And she even says that, I don't need to risk it. I can take care of myself. <laughs> it's very ironic. Rey is handed uh, more or less a lightsaber because there is some connection between her and that lightsaber. And Maz kind of acts sort of like a mentor -y, yoda -y, almost Ben kind of character, just in a very short amount of time in letting her know what this thing is. Just like in Star Wars, Ben is the mentor that kind of triggers Luke's interest in all this that's going on having to do with the Force. Yes, in Empire Strikes Back becomes even bigger when he's introduced to Yoda. But, you know, Ben is the catalyst here where Luke becomes all of a sudden aware of what's happening. As I mentioned earlier, the super weapon is, is used to destroy an entire 
solar system in uh, Force Awakens and in Star Wars uh, One Planet Alderaan, obviously. Both films will have some sort of an aerial assault on the big weapony thing. Uh, we have it in Force Awakens towards the end when they all go after the planet once they, the shields are down. And then you also obviously have it in the Death Star trench battle with, you know, very iconic, you know, at the end of... You always got to have some kind of space battle. This is, after all, cold. You know, this is Star Wars. It has to have space war ships flying kind of stuff. For Rey, not so much in the Force, but she does kind of find a mentor more for the... I guess you can call it a fatherly figure or a pilot mentor type of person with Han Solo. There is a connection that gets formed briefly, unfortunately, because, you know, obviously we all know what happens to Solo. But it kind of mimics a little bit, at least at first, you know, before we get to the second film, of what Luke then has with Ben, the person that, you know, the first person that becomes a mentor to Luke that would then lead on to a bigger, even bigger mentor. Like I said earlier, with Luke, you have Yoda, that will be his next bigger, even bigger mentor. But for her, again, a similar situation, where Han kind of introduces her to the mentorship idea, let's say. And then later on, it's followed on with Luke in The Last Jedi, acting as Yoda would in an empire. In both these films, Chewie becomes the second banana to the Falcon's pilot, you know, eventually at, by the time of The Force Awakens, Chewie does become her co-pilot because she then becomes the pilot of the Falcon. Just like in Star Wars, you know, there's a pair. There's Han and Chewie. Now you have Rey and Chewie as the second banana. In The Force Awakens, the resistance is quite small. But it's even like unknown. It's like a hidden resistance. They're 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 even a quietly part of a of a secondary type of thing where uh, not not even the 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 official you know they don't want to be an officially recognized branch. They're kind of like almost like a secret secret little army that is kind of looking out for things. But they're very you know kind of hidden. In Star Wars, you obviously have the rebellion, and obviously these two are connected so clearly connected. But again, they're always on the run. They're always quietly hidden and that sort of thing. And like I mentioned earlier, also with the plan of getting rid of whatever it is that the big weapon has in terms of in order to get rid of this big weapon, this big gun, you have to deactivate some sort of shield. You can't just go there and blow it up. It creates a little more drama because you have a secondary group trying to achieve something, you know, for story purposes. Uh, here you have in The Force Awakens, you know, the infiltration group that is there to kind of blow up the internal shield so that the ships can get in. And in Star Wars, specifically in Return of the Jedi, you have a similar situation with the, the shield that Endor, the, you know, that the bunker in Endor is providing over the Death Star to allow, you know, the fleet to be able to come in and blow things up. So, as you can see, there's already a history of similarities in story beats certain points have to be actually get hit that are very very familiar between the original star wars and the force awakens now before the last jedi you are going to have similar beats take place but this time around they focus a little more on empire and return of the jedi so for example both films begin in a similar fashion where they just scored a major victory against the bad guys. A, a considerable victory. You know, Starkiller weapon has been destroyed at the end of The Force Awakens. And uh, the Death Star has been blown up at the end of Star Wars. But now you begin the movie. And even though they just scored this great, you know, achievement, they're still on the run. They are somehow the bad guys have kind of turned it around and are chasing the good guys. They're still on the run. In Empire, it takes a, a, a couple years later, I believe, in terms of how much time has passed. So they've been kind of running, theoretically, from planet to planet, you know, I guess doing missions and this and that. But they now find themselves in a situation where uh, they are hiding. They're in a secret base that they actually got there not too long ago. You kind of get the feel from, you know, again, watching the movie or reading some of the material that it's not necessarily that they're still unpacking, but that it's still a fresh like kind of like a un, not fully charted planet when they get surprised by the Empire. But in Last Jedi, they're in a very similar situation. But here, they show up like, what, 20 minutes later? A day later? You know, it's you get the feeling that it just happened maybe hours 
I would, I, I wouldn't even, I mean, I would, I, I don't know if I could even say it's a day later, you know, it's hard to say. It seems like it just happened right then. So, you know, okay, they're, they're trying to do this again. They're trying to mimic these beats that already uh, we've seen before. Definitely the bad guys are on the offensive. Uh, they somehow recovered magnificently. Uh, now, granted, you could say, all right, well, you know, the weapon was just a weapon and it was just a planet that had the weapon but the the might of the first order is everywhere you know they're as we learn later that they, they have this flying ship that is basically the capital of their empire whatever we want to call their 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 domain they don't even have a home planet but uh they can kind of go anywhere and and be as overwhelming as 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 anybody else as, as, even as far as as the emperor used to be i guess from you know, directing everything from Coruscant until he would move into the Death Stars and that sort of thing. By the time we get to the second act of The Last Jedi, we are now engaged in what would be considered to be a very slow chase. You are now in chase mode. We introduced earlier in the film that the Resistance is on the run, and now we're going to spend a considerable amount of time with the majority of our Resistance just being chased through space. On Empire, you have a similar situation, if you think about it, because uh, once the Battle of Hoth is done, and everybody kind of, I think, understands from the beginning that they cannot beat these Adats. The, these things are way too big. They don't have, you know, the, the, the Rebellion ships in Hoth are not equipped for this kind of battle. So uh, the best that they can do is kind of just slow things down as much as possible in order for everybody to get away. The difference being that in Empire... While a big chunk of the the film, you know, the second act, a big chunk of the second act is just basically a chase. Uh, the Empire is chasing the Falcon. But what they manage to do in this film is that they kind of divert. Everybody else goes in one direction. Vader's forces, they focus on the Falcon and chasing the Falcon. For all you know, there might be other Star Destroyers chasing the, the Rebels, but because they jump to hyperspace, they're able to get away. And the reason why... The Falcon cannot get away, and we are engaged in this movie-length chase, is because of the hyperdrive is broken. So the hyperdrive becomes a very important aspect of the story of why we're engaged in this in this uh, kind of chase. However, the Empire chase is very different. It's a much it's, it's a much more kinetic, fast, actiony chase as opposed to this other chase that it's just not. It's just kind of somewhat dull and boring it's like bing bing they're shooting from far away they're scoring some shots you know that kind of thing not very actiony on the last jedi you have the visit the canto bite which i guess fulfills the the checkbox of for example having to visit an area with a lot of diverse creatures uh the equivalent of a new hope you know visiting the cantina or maybe I would say in Empire, the, the equivalent of going to Bespin and being able to see a brand new city with brand new people. And, you know, you do see some different uh, creatures in the background and stuff like that. So you get to visit something new that gives us that, you know, they didn't do a, a complete a repeat uh, during Empire or even during Jedi of the cantina, you know, but here, you know, as in The Force Awakens, there were, you, you know, when you go to Maskatan's castle and you do see the... All these weird creatures. At Cantabite, you do still have a nice big collection of weird creatures. Granted, it's under a different, more luxurious setting. Towards the end of The Last Jedi, we have the Battle of Crait, which is very reminiscent of the Battle of Hoth in Empire. You know, you're dealing with a very whitish environment. You have these adats coming at you. And the Rebellion or the Resistance, they have these very smaller ships that cannot do a damn thing against these larger ships. So... You know, you do have that similarity there, again, created. Uh, granted, in Empire, this happens at the beginning of the film. Here, it happens at the end of the film. Well, the obvious, you know, Ray training with Luke, it is a huge callback to Luke training with Yoda. Granted, it's under different circumstances, but you do spend a big chunk of the film, you know, acclimating yourself to this potential trainer who doesn't want to train you just like Yoda didn't want to train Luke at first then changes his mind and even here with Ray and Luke you know you kind of go through that in you know the beginning he doesn't want to train her at all and then he kind of reluctantly trains her and then at the end he kind of reluctantly changes his mind at the last minute kind of thing 
which is a whole other issue <laughs> that we have to talk about. But you do see that those beats, these two stories are going while the bad guys are being chased in both films. You know, your lead is being trained, is going through their proper training, you know, on the other, you know, the B. I don't, I don't think going to, uh, it's not necessarily an A and a B story. They're kind of both equally important stories. You do have other B and C stories happening, but these are two important parallel stories being told at the same time. Both films also have a an encounter while being trained that is a little unusual, and that is with The Last Jedi, you do have Rey going to that cave where she sees the reflections in the mirrors, where she's trying to find out about her parents, and, you know, she finds out or appears to have found out something very personal about herself, you know, about her anonymity. Uh, that we later learn a little more from Kylo Ren. Whether that's true or not, we don't know at this point. Just like Luke, during his training with Yoda, goes to the um, the cave tree, and, and he sees, you know, the, the Vader image with Luke's head on it, you know. So he kind of finds about himself that he has the potential to be just as, you know, to, to go the wrong path. So he does get some kind of major revelation, uh, you know, because of that. Both in The Last Jedi and The Empire Strikes Back, we have your apprentices, if you will, leaving without being fully trained. In The Last Jedi, even though Luke reluctantly provides Rey with some training, but it's more like sarcastic training, if you will. It's not exactly the Yoda type of training. She does have to leave because, you know, she needs to help her friends. Whether or not Luke is coming to help at that moment, she doesn't really know, and she doesn't she doesn't really think he is coming. She needs to leave to help her friends. And in Empire, same situation. You know, Luke gets a vision of Han and Leia in trouble, and he has to cut his training short. You know, promising to return, but we are in this situation once again where her training is kind of cut short. Even though if you really think about it, her training wasn't really training. In other words, her mission was to bring Luke back. But in the process of trying to convince him, she's getting some training. So th there are slightly different circumstances, but it's the same kind of scenario happening here. The way that they framed, you know, Luke's death at the end of this film is a little reminiscent of the way Yoda dies in Return of the Jedi. You know, in Last Jedi, Luke doesn't really die as a result. Well, see, see this, is, this is hard to uh, explain. It is implied that as a result of this long-distance projection that he does, because right before that, there didn't seem to be many problems with him physically or medically, at least. But as a result of this long-distance projection, you know, even Kylo Ren says, oh, you know, it would take such effort, it would kill you to project, you know, from so far away, you know, when he's seeing the, the, the ray visions. But for, you know, I guess as, as an audience, we're led to believe that the projection of him all the way in crate you know, from his island, kind of like suck the life out of him. Do we buy that? Eh, what are you going to do? You take what you get. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, Padme died of a broken heart. Okay, she died of a broken heart. <laughs> okay, fine, we'll go with it. But the manner in which he dies, and that is that he really doesn't die, if you really think about it, as a result of the battle that he's fighting. I think he dies as a result of the projection. You know, just the... The mere exercise of projecting your image in such a long distance is enough to, I guess, drain the life out of you. Because, again, when Kylo Ren mentions that just that communication he's having with Rey, and they're not necessarily fighting, they're not in, in a duel, they're just communicating. So that is the implication, which is why I say that the fight itself is not the death, it's the communication taking place that we are led to believe causes his death but in the manner that it is staged you know in his island that it is kind of like a peaceful death for him you know he is exhausted he is then force ghosted out if you will similar to yoda you know it's kind of like not his choosing as opposed to the obi-wan death where he chose that moment and he didn't do anything specific that as a viewer you would say oh He's pressing that secret button or he is, you know, he's not stabbing himself, you know, killing himself, but he is willing himself to be, I guess, taken by the force. Here, it's more like 
the force has taken him in a way and he's kind of giving into it. Similar to Yoda in Return of the Jedi, where, you know, he is preparing for his death, but he doesn't seem to be as much in control of it as Obi-Wan was during uh, A New Hope. Now, the other thing is, again, a similarity in both these films is that in The Last Jedi, Rey wants to turn Kylo into the light side of the Force, if you will. She sees, I guess, good in him or potential of turning him. In the movie, we later find out that he wants to also turn her into his side. And that is one of the, I guess you can call it a plot twist, where after they both have this battle with with Snoke's, uh, with Snoke and his guards, and she feels that, wow, I think I did it. I think he's on my side now. He kind of flips the script on her and says, no, you should be on my side and we can control everything. That is very similar to Empire Strikes Back, where... You know, Vader wants Luke to join him because he believes that they can defeat the Emperor. Just like Kylo, you know, was, I guess, all along planning on defeating Snoke. Vader, that was his original plan that he tells Luke in Bespin. And by the time we get to Jedi, it's the other way around. You know, even though Vader still planning on doing that, Luke senses good in Vader and does the opposite, tries to convert him to his side and eventually succeeds, you know, by the end of Return of the Jedi. Both of these films also have pretty major duels, which is a standard of a Star Wars film, I guess, a Star Wars film that deals with Force and Jedi, I guess, or Sith. Obviously, if you don't have those characters, you most likely will not have those sort of fights take place. But yeah, in in The Last Jedi, you have this awesome, awesome duel with the Praetorian Guards and even Snoke at first, you know, that was absolutely my favorite part of that film. And I think it stands out as one of the best, if not the best, lightsaber duel that I've ever seen, or at least lightsaber versus some other weapon that can withstand uh, a lightsaber, let's put it that way. Just like in Empire, you know, you have the Luke and Vader duel, and then in Jedi, you have the Luke and Vader duel with Palpatine, you know, (laughs) on the side. You know, it's very similar, the taunting of your opponent and all that kind of stuff that Snoke does, just like the Emperor did. On the Last Jedi, and even on, uh, and even before that, you know, you have a lot of this punishing of Hux uh, via hologram, especially on the Last Jedi. Uh, there's a couple of scenes where you know uh, Snoke is able to, you know, rough up Hux. Grant that he's not killing him, but in uh, Empire, there's plenty of scenes where Vader is just very disappointed at his officers and. Via hologram, he's able to kind of dispatch them quite a bit. And even in, and in some of them, it's implied that it's even done in person. So, you know, we are getting that uh, that feel of, you know, how, you know, treacherous they are in punishing their own troops. In uh, Last Jedi, it is implied, or at least the accusation is thrown out there, that it was Luke's fault that... Kylo Ren turned out the way he was. The explanation or the whose side of the story, you know, you kind of lean towards depends on which way you go, but it is implied that what Luke did, as aggressive as it might or might not have been, it was perceived the wrong way, and it did become a trigger, a catalyst for what then Kylo Ren will do. At that point, he was known as Ben. Whether he would have done that anyway, it is pretty well, I think, perceived that he would have. In other words, when he kind of burst into his, uh, his into his tent or into his home and he held out the lightsaber, you know, he might have put it away and changed his mind. But Ben kind of took it more as a he's here to kill me. You know, I better do what I was going to do right now and just get it over with. So, you know, the accusation is kind of thrown out there, and I think it might have been by Rey, when she's frustrated at him, that that Luke created Kylo Ren. You know, because of that conflict that they had is what triggered him, which is also something that if you think about in Star Wars, you know, Ben could also be accused of creating Darth Vader in a way because, you know, he 
did everything for Anakin. You know, he accepted training him, you know, by his, his master's orders, Qui-Gon. He continued with his training. He continued with all of his development. And even though he started to see some bad tendencies in him, he was never able to control or stop him or bring him back. And all the way up to the end, you know, he also, in a way, allowed him to live because at the end, when he maims him in Mustafar, this whole story could have ended by him killing him, but he didn't. He left him there, in theory, I guess, to die on his own. I guess you could say it was his way of showing him some sort of mercy, but that mercy resulted in him becoming the mechanical Darth Vader that we then later know <laughs> and accept as, you know, this tyrant, you know, this puppet for the, uh, for the Emperor. So indirectly, he is responsible for what Vader has become, you know, you know, afterwards, after he goes, after he turns dark. In The Last Jedi, we also are introduced to the character of DJ, which, you know, I have my issues with DJ, but the point of DJ, I think, in this film is to kind of throw a shady character, a character that we don't know if we can trust or not. Similar to an empire where we have Lando, same situation. He's a shady character at first who then betrays everyone, but at the end, he kind of helps everyone. Here you have DJ who is shady to begin with, and then he helps us, but then he betrays us at the end. So they, again, they, they did a, a mathematical flip on the shady character. They just said, all right, instead of, uh, instead of uh, uh, betrayal and help, let's do help and betrayal. <laughs> so it's, it, again, you got these little similarities taking place. We have uh, scenarios in these two films also where you have some sort of secret code that will hopefully allow us to get a little deeper into whatever mission it is that we have. And that, you know, it's the type of thing where everybody has to hold their breath for a second because they're entering the code and we're seeing how the bad guys are reacting. In Last Jedi, Rose and DJ, you know, they're, you know, they, especially with DJ, he has to enter the secret code so they can actually infiltrate, you know, into Snoke's ship. And, you know, everybody's holding their breath and they're allowing them to go through those shields and then they all kind of all make it through. And even inside the ship, there are certain areas where they have to kind of put in their special codes and that sort of thing. And in Jedi... Very typical example, and that's probably where it came from. You know, it's the shuttle Tidarium delivering the code so they can go into Endor. So you have those beats, those dramatic, oh my God, can they make it past this point beat. There's scenes in both films where you have to disguise yourself as the enemy in traditional disguise, not just a robe or something. But on Last Jedi, we have our heroes, Finn and, and DJ and Rose, dressed as, as, as First Order officers, you know, top to bottom, the whole outfit. They have to put that on to infiltrate into. And it's like how many some people are kind of looking at them strange and they, they still let them go by and this and that sort of thing. Just like in even A New Hope, if you think about it, you know, Luke and Han dressed as stormtroopers you know, taking Chewbacca around as a prisoner, you know, it kind of fits in, but, you know, some people do give him the, you know, they give him the stink eye of what's going on with these two. And we also have the traditional, I guess you can call it flip of the trap. In other words, we find out in Last Jedi that it is Snoke who's the one who's allowing this connection to take place between Rey and and Kylo Ren, and they're both completely unaware of it. They think it's just, I guess, naturally happening between the two of them or something. And then he explains that he did that on purpose to get her to think that she could turn him so that, that she would be brought to him in some shape or form or she would come to him, which is exactly what I guess Snoke wanted to get her in front of him so he, she, so he could kill her or turn her. But he kind of understands that he's not turning her anywhere. But you also have the same situation happening with the Emperor in Return of the Jedi, where he was purposely allowed the location of the second Death Star, where it's being built, to be leaked, you know, to the rebels. So this way they would come to them and attempt to destroy it, unbeknownst to them, but it was already operational, even though it was under construction. And that is supposed to be the trapped. You know, the trap is to get them there so he can wipe them out. And at the same time, you know, he has his own plans with Luke. He wants Luke to take over for Vader and, I guess, kill Vader, just like in a traditional Sith manner, which we kind of seen something like that also in 
I think it must have been in Revenge of the Sith when Anakin and Obi-Wan tried to rescue Palpatine. And then when Obi-Wan is, you know, unconscious, you know, Palpatine kind of stages it so that Anakin has to fight Dooku. And that is kind of the plan. You know, Dooku is his apprentice, more or less, because obviously Darth Maul got killed or, well, he didn't get killed. Now we know what happened to him. But... You know, even even Dooku is looking at him like, wait a minute, is this supposed to be a boom? And he kills him right there. So, you know, it's part of the plan. So we have seen this, you know, master uh, uh, apprentice thing happen many times before or, or, you know, the springing of the trap, if you will. But like you said... It, it is happening in this film too. So this, you know, this this at least gives us a little background of the fact that it's really no secret, and you really cannot defend the argument or the idea that these films are purposely made to remind you of the original trilogy, of the beats of the original trilogy. The prequels, they might have their problems, and they have their problems. Don't get me wrong, the prequels have... Last Jedi size problems in some of them in different places, but they at least follow a different beat. They were telling a different story, even though you knew where those stories were going to lead because they're a prequel and you know certain characters will live and certain characters might or might not die. But I never got the feel that with the prequels, we were getting a beat by beat mimicking of something that came earlier. So that's how things are a little similar between these trilogies. Now, the question becomes, while preserving the overall structure of The Last Jedi, is it conceivably possible to keep the structure of the story and make some changes to it so it becomes a little more plausible, acceptable, fit in with the Star Wars universe that we're familiar with, but most importantly, fit in with the previous film that has established the rules? Again, when you're creating a new trilogy, you establish the rules and then you follow through. You know, you don't do the reboot in the middle, like I said about a thousand times already. So, for example, in The Last Jedi, you know, you can kind of divide the story into different sections. So, for example, one section of the story is the entire chase from the moment they escape the planet in the beginning of the film all the way to the chase through the universe, very short universe. If if you really think about it, to them landing on Crate and having their final battle there, okay? That's one story. Then the other story is Rey. Rey spends a good chunk of the film, you know, doing her thing with Luke, okay? Then you also have the Canto Bite sequence of some of our heroes going to a different location in order to try to accomplish something else that really doesn't accomplish much. Okay, got it. So those are the three main stories that we're chasing in this film. You know, traditionally you would say the A story, the B story, and the C story. In this particular case, the A and B story, you know, the chase through the universe and the Ray story, I would not call them A and B because I would call them A and A because those are two important parallel stories that serve a specific purpose that more or less works, let's say. Forget the details. I'm talking about the overarching purpose of that story. With Canto Bite, I would call that the B story. And that's a B story that really, to me, does not work and doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't give you anything to the overall story being told other than something for characters to do without interfering with the main stories, more or less. So, let's look at the... A story, the chase. The A story, the chase would be, as I mentioned, escaping the, the, the base, which I have no problems with the way they escape the base. The actual chase itself, them arriving at some sort of planet for a final, you know, hand to hand kind of uh, battle, a land battle. And Luke arriving in some form at the last minute to help them, which would then result in his death in one way or the other. But it allowing the rest of our heroes to be able to escape and reunite with Rey and Chewbacca where they're off to the next adventure. Okay, so that's the general structure, and that's the structure that I believe you can continue to keep it by making certain modifications. The other A story would be Rey 
and Luke training. Granted, he will be reluctant in his training at first, similar to Yoda. He was a little reluctant at first. But then he agrees to teach her how to do whatever it is that she's trying to do. And at the same time, he would also agree to come back with her to help. However, we wouldn't take as long to, you know, to have him change his mind about training. We wouldn't have him be grumpy old man this entire time. And then Ray does come back to join our heroes at the final battle where we can do a combination of things that would, I think, would please everyone and would not disturb the story too much. Canto Bite, there's just nothing I can imagine we can do with Canto Bite. So I'm going to put that aside for now <laughs> because I have to think about it a little longer. Maybe by the time I'm done, you know, with these other two A stories. The main thing that I would do with the chase, the A story, is I would change the chase to be a faster chase. One of the biggest complaints, and I even I felt it myself, was that the chase itself was very slow. It's a very slow chase. It is not a very action-y, exciting kind of chase. I mean, I do get the point that they're destroying ships one by one as they s slowly start running out of fuel, but that's the point. Everything involves slowly arriving at some destination or some outcome, but it's done very slowly. It is not a very kinetic type of thing. So what I would do is I would change the story so that instead of them realizing after one jump that they're being tracked, make it so that it takes them at least two jumps to realize that they're being tracked. And that whenever these jumps occur, they are within distance, within shooting distance of these ships. So in other words, it is not a coincidence, let's put it that way, that, oh, the ships are just randomly, or for whatever reason, they just, when the first order ships come out of hyperspace, they're just far enough to kind of hit them, but not enough to destroy them, to create that distance. No, I would say you come out of hyperspace and you're on top of them pretty much similar to what happened in rogue one you know when 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 the fleet arrived they were on top of them and they were destroying them so i would have kept that tension that would have been such a much more exciting dangerous condition where the fleet arrives and they're on top of you and then they're knocking ships down left and right and the only thing you can do at that point is jump again so that would buy you a little time. Now, what you do is in between these jumps, and I'm saying we would do a total of about three jumps, but it takes them about two jumps to realize that they're being tracked. So in other words, the first jump, they arrived and they're knocking them down and they really don't have the time to analyze what's happening. All they can do at that point is perform another jump and they do that second jump. But you can have a pretty lengthy, you know, flashy battle take place with a lot of ships you know, fighting and destroying each other and that sort of thing, where everybody's like, we need to do another jump, you know, plot the new coordinates. So you go to the new coordinates. Now, here's what you do. The first jump could be something very traditional, like a typical space scene. You know, you're in space and people are fighting left and right. Great, wonderful. Second jump, make them jump to a, another location that is at least visually different. Something that will be one of these things where that I enjoy about Star Wars films is that we get to visit these different locations and we get to have these battles, let's say, at a different look. You know, we had snow, we create, you have, you know, uh, assault, which is kind of like snow if you really think about it, not very creative. But, you know, you could go to some jungle location or something like that. But I'm saying have it so that the fleet, in order to hide themselves from the first order, they have to kind of find cover. Now, granted, you can't bring ships really low in the atmosphere because I don't think that's been done too much before, but maybe you can bring them low enough so that they can create some cloud cover or they can hover above certain planets where there are some places to hide. Hell, go to some planet where there's like, um, let's say like rocks, huge rocks or mountains where the Star Destroyers have to kind of maneuver around these large rock formations and the fleet also, and that kind of helps them in order to disguise themselves and provide the audience with a different kind of chase being done at that point. So you have a different location. 
you can go to either you can make another jump for example or you could be in an area where for example some kind of space nebula where the ships kind of hide and drift in and out and that's how these battles are taking place and they are able to camouflage themselves so by the time they do get to this third jump they realize listen we did three jumps we're losing ships left and right we need to take this battle down to ground level somewhere you know uh, because we we are almost out of ships at this point so that i think would create enough of a excitement you know visual excitement to this chase to give it a little more umph you know an empire now granted you know you know i've mentioned before how certain things are duplicated well kind of i would say like an empire you know the falcon is being chased you know through uh half this movie but it's exciting because we get to see the falcon going different environments at first it's just plain open space then you're you know in an asteroid field then you're so low you know close to an asteroid that it's almost like you know he's inside of a cave in between rocks he's being chased so even though the same thing is happening you know for a prolonged amount of time the same activity is taking place the fact that you're putting them in different locations makes it more exciting and i think we could have done that this is something that i don't think has been done yet so they could have done that they could have brought the fleet granted you know the the rebel fleet is not exactly you know as huge as the first order fleet you know the first order fleet would have a little trouble maneuvering in in tight you know in tight close spaces so you know you would have all of the uh, smaller ships, the TIE fighter type of ships, you know, up front, and then the big ships following behind. And that would at least give you an excuse for why they're not catching them as fast, you know, as opposed to just saying, oh, we are within the this range and we are, our, our bullets, you know, our bullets, our, our lasers, our, our batteries cannot, you know, reach that far ahead. You know, we're just going to write them out. Okay, that's uh, that's the way they chose to go. So... Like I said, by the time you get to the third jump, let's say, we visited three different locations. And like I mentioned, you could start with space, traditional space dogfights, perfect. Second one could be something very different. You go to a low atmosphere planet where you have obstacles, whether it's a jungle or mountain locations. So you can then maneuver large ships around that. They have to kind of get out of the way because they're so low. And then you make the third jump and you're in some sort of nebula. Think Star Trek two, you know, hiding in the nebula, you know, cat and mouse type of games uh, where that, but at that point they're like, listen, we're almost out of fuel. We're almost out of ships. You know, our ships are being decimated. We need to land because we cannot win this battle in the air. So that's when you go to crate and say, all right, we're going to do a last stand. You know, it's the Alamo now and we're going to this old base that we used to have. You know, we, we don't have to keep it a secret. We don't have to create this whole, you know, uh, traitor, uh, Haldo's group over here, Poe Dameron's group over there. We don't have to do that. We don't have to have them turn on each other. That's not necessary. So, yes, at that point they do go. And they're like, okay, this is our last stand type of thing. With Ray, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you do go through the traditional beats of her just, I'm coming here to get Luke. Luke doesn't want to. Luke is pissed off. Luke is weird. Okay, give him a little bit of weirdness. That's fine. Let him, let him get out of his head. But bring him out of his head fast enough by many different means. You can have him open up to the Force faster. This way he understands what happened to Han and what's happening to Leia. Because by this point... Leia still could have been hurt during one of these attacks. She could have been hurt. And they could have still used the ridiculous, you know, Mary Poppins scene. But what I saw on the internet, somebody did, and people are having the same... People love it, people hate it. Reaction, somebody re-edited quickly the scene where Leia gets shot into space. And it is Luke, not necessarily Leia. It is Luke through that projection that he is able to force her back into the ship you know she is practically dead but it's not like she you know we don't see her opening her eyes we don't see her being the person in charge of controlling that move itself it is luke that's doing that so what you then do is between luke re-experiencing or being able to know through the force that han is dead and leia almost just died and he had to help her. That's what got kind of gets him out of his funk. And he's like, you know what? You're right. You know, I've been an idiot. I'm sorry. 
let's do this, you know, in some good way, obviously not just those words. So we do go through an intensive uh, training that he's like, okay, we're going to go, but you need a few things you need to learn before that, including, you know, she could still have her, her cave uh, mirror experience. I would make it a little more definitive because I wouldn't lean so much towards the you're a nobody. The you're a nobody is a good thing for Kylo Ren to say, because he is trying to hurt her. He is trying to do something so that she would join him. So he is lying to her. But from the cave, which is something more force oriented, if you will, I would have a more pleasant, if you will, or positive uh, message. Not so much to leave her out in the dark. Yes, you could give her the message of beware of the force or beware of the Sith. You know, beware of just like Luke had his message, you know, if you're not careful, you could turn. Well, that's not the message that she got. That's not the message that she, that's not the question she was asking. You know, she, she, she was asking about her parents. So I would kind of work on that a little more. So that is not such a, you know, banging on, on your head that you're a nobody, bang, you're a nobody, bang. You know, everybody's just banging on your head that you're a nobody in this particular film. So I would kind of split that up a little bit. So Spend some time training, do some positive training things, get rid of the stupid jokes. I mean, you can make jokes, but you have to realize when you're going over the top with the jokes. I mentioned it way on a previous episode. Uh, it's not that the jokes are not funny. It's that they belong in a different show. They belong in Robot Chicken. They belong in The Family Guy. They're funny. Don't get me wrong. The Luke milking that cow was funny, but inappropriate. If they ever make a creature, if Hasbro makes that big fat cow thing with the milk, I'm going to get it because it is such a funny thing. Just like Zero the Hut was, I found them to be ridiculous and then funny, but inappropriate. You know what I mean? It's inappropriate. So they should have done a pass at this film to kind of remove the inappropriate jokes. The opening, you know, your mama joke, it's cute how he's buying time, but it gets to be a little too much. There's a little too much of it, and it becomes something else. So they needed to pull back on the humor a little bit. So let's say Luke is training her, and guess what? They both fly off together because she's stars, she, she might be seeing some you know, images, just like Luke did in Empire, of my friends are in danger. I really got to get to them now. They're really having a problem. Uh, I have to get out there. And they go, okay, let's go. Let's all go. And they all go. And... um. And they arrive. And what I would do is Luke could at first, at first, he could meet with Leia and meet with some of them, the, the important characters, and have those heart-to-heart -heart moments with them. And he also kind of understands that, you know, him saving Leia hurt him. That has damaged him. Now, how do we portray that? I don't know. We already established that Kylo Ren said that long connection could kill someone. Okay. He could even show signs of something happening where through exposition, you would say he, maybe he's talking to R2 and say, Hey, yes, R2, you know, that thing I did with, you know, to Leia to save her, it, you know, it hurt me. It was a high, high price to pay or something, you know, something dramatic like that. But he's coming anyway. He's coming to help and he's going to do what he can. Granted, he's also an old man. He's not, you know, backflippy type of, uh, you know, he's kind of like Obi-Wan. He's not going to be moving as fast. <laughs> so he can show up there and have a moment with C-3PO and, and have a moment with Leia, obviously. You know, say hello to all his friends properly. Not so much the new people. We don't really care too much about the new people. But make those connections with those original trilogy characters that are still around. And have him have a small chat about Han. And, you know, kind of pour his heart out to Leia. And it pours out her heart to him. And reconcile, you know, I failed, you know, with Kylo. I'm so sorry. You know, don't worry about it. You know, it's not your fault. It was, you know, have that conversation take place. And then all of a sudden, they're coming. They're here. So... Everybody gets into place, and as they're getting into place, you know, Luke says, all right, I have an idea. So he kind of goes on his own, you know, to the side to do his own thing. And, you know, Ray could be on the Falcon as part of the air support that they're having there. Fine, that's fine, because the Falcon then just diverts some of those ships somewhere else, like they did in the film later on. So from somewhere in the cave, Luke can come out and project himself, not across the universe, but across, I don't know, 100 feet. 100 yards, something. 
And whether or not he looks younger, that's something that we could kind of figure out. He could look exactly like himself, or he can make himself look younger on purpose to drive Kylo a little wackier. So just like they do in the film, rather than continue to, you know, pound on the on the resistance, they stop everything and they focus on him because Kylo loses his mind when he sees him, you know. Yeah, if he looks like he did when he was younger, it might make him even angrier, which kind of works. Maybe that's why he did it in the first place, you know, in the original film. So they can have that whole shoot at him and nothing hurts him because he's a projection. And then Luke is kind of calling him to come down. So as he comes down in a different area and encounters the young looking Luke, at that point, Luke can come down from the rocks somewhere and take the place of the projection. Or Kylo Ren could have a short battle with the projection just to tire him out a little bit. And then Luke takes over. After he, he he cuts him in half, for example, but nothing happens, then Luke comes down and continues the fight, but he's really not there to fight. He's just stalling time. And then Luke can have a traditional Obi-Wan kind of death where, you know what? I'm not here to fight. I'm just here to stall. <laughs> and he puts his lightsaber down like Obi-Wan did, and Kylo slices him in half, and Luke disappears just like Ben did. So at this point, Kylo is even more enraged than before. He realizes that something is just definitely not right. And he orders everybody to charge, you know, come into the actual caves to kind of flush them out and kill everybody. But at this point, you know, between intercutting, we get shots of everybody in the base realizing that things are not going good and that this is just a stall tactic. But they do realize, you know, they do figure out that, uh, you know, there is something deep in the cave that they can come out the other side. And again, around this time, you can have Rey flying around, like I said before, to the point where she's already gotten rid of all of those TIE fighters. And now she's in the back of the cave, like in the film itself, The Last Jedi helping everybody to come out using force powers, levitating the rocks, just like we've seen before. So by intercutting this, you get the sense that Luke every now and then is like looking and you cut to them escaping out the back. So you get that juxtapositioning of events to give you the idea that it's a stall tactic just to get everybody out and everybody out of there. And that's kind of how we wrap it up with them escaping out the back. Now, let me go into some specific issues that we might have mentioned already or might have not kind of glazed over a little bit like i said earlier all the humor has to be toned down all those you know the 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 yo mama stuff and the the sea cow and the you know all that just over the top kind of stuff um, that has to be toned down luke's grumpiness has to be toned way down you can have it at first a little bit but it has to get pulled back at a certain point because it's just overwhelmingly grumpy leia's flying scene as i mentioned with that video that i saw online works much better if you give the reason for her survival to luke instead of her it doesn't just kind of like oh my god all of a sudden she's so capable of so many things and it's a kind of like a waste because now you're going to lose this character anyway. Granted, you know, nobody knew that she was going to die for real, but it just doesn't work. It didn't work. Even if she was coming back, I, I still would have had the same reaction to it. So it works much better because it's also the catalyst for Luke's injury, his downward spiral of pain, let's say, that damages him so much, being able to save her. You know, he can still pull off what he pulls off here by physically showing up. The airlock issue when Leia comes in is something that still would have to be fixed. you got to create some kind of airlock because it's just, you know, and I'm not the first person to mention that. The Knights of Ren, we get a brief glimpse of them during The Force Awakens. Here, nothing. Zip. Zilch. I think the way that you can bring in the Knights of Ren as a way of teasing, let's say, the following film is during one of those flashback sequences where Luke or Kylo or, or Rey is, is, is seeing, you know, what happened between between Luke and, uh, and Kylo, really Ben back then, have it end with not just the destruction of the temple, but have Kylo walking around with these uh, Sithy kind of Padawans that, like I say in the story, turned on the rest of them. So have them battling the, you know, Luke's side of the Padawans versus the 
Kylo side of the Padawan and, 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 you know, show some dynamic kind of fighting, not so much as what we see with the Praetorian Guards, but something in that vein of these guys are dance and they're brutal and they're ruthless, you know, as opposed to the other ones. And, you know, you can see them coming down, you know, the slaying the, the good Padawans. So you get a little more of that. And at least you give the audience a little bit of something that you teased in the previous film. Give them a little more now about it. Maybe in the next one we actually see them, you know, something like that. Yoda, Yoda's look is something that really bothered me, especially at first when we first saw him. He looked kind of strange to me. He's, his cheek, cheeks look very very chubby and very weird looking. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was watching CGI or a puppet. And I know, I believe it was a puppet, but there was just something odd. Maybe the way they lit him. Maybe he's not properly lit or the way we used to see him lit. But that is something that I'm still trying to figure out. Was Yoda really necessary in this film? Uh, did we need to bring him in to help Luke push him over the edge to do the right thing, let's say, to change his mind, to, to, to agree to help, to get this burden off his back of being a failure? You know, that's something that, again, we could keep it or we could take it out. Uh, Luke's changing, changing his mind might not necessarily have needed Yoda's prodding. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Yoda, the fact that He's there. I love the fact that he shows up. I just wasn't very happy with the way he was used or the way that he looked at certain shots. So, again, when Ray is having her visions, uh, you know, under my <laughs> particular slant on this, and Luke uh, is is deciding that yes, you know, Leia's in trouble. I need to help her now. I definitely have to get off my butt and help. You could kind of add a little bit of maybe a Yoda vision, you know, maybe he has a vision with Yoda, maybe he does have another encounter with Yoda, where he tells them about, you know, failure and all that stuff, encapsulate that a little bit more, to kind of help him be like a third way of what drives him to say, all right, enough of this, I'm going out there to help everybody. Snoke's backstory. Well, unless they're somehow pulling you know, a 360 or a 180, actually, a 360 brings you back to where you were, a 180, and actually given us some backstory on the next one, I still would have given the fans something about Snoke to kind of chew on. I don't think you can create such a mysterious, powerful character and then just say, no, that's not it. I mean, I understand the how you build this, you know, Kylo's just biding his time because eventually he wants to destroy his master and become the master. I get that. With the Emperor, you know, we had this thing where Vader mentions to Luke that, yeah, we can defeat the Emperor, we can become, you know, rule the galaxy, father and son, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? We really didn't pay too much attention to that. We were kind of like, oh my God, Luke is, is, is Vader's son. Oh my God, I can't believe that. That we were just so blown away by that other thing that it kind of blew us away and we didn't pay too much attention. Here, I think we've built so much of a huge, no pun intended, Star Wars empire and franchise, and in terms of story potentials, that we need to give such a major character a little bit of a something to, to help us making, I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't know if you want to say a little more ironic, a little more relevant, a little more connected. I don't know if we want to go that far. But there should have been something about him that is special, a little more special than just, you know, mystery bad guy, undefined mystery bad guy. I kind of see, you know, how this might work if you're watching like some kind of kung fu or karate film or something where, and I've seen, you know, if you watch all the Grindhouse stuff, uh, you know, the 70s and the early 80s, where you have this, you know, period piece somewhere in China, and, and you have the master, the evil master with the twirly mustache, and, and you have his henchmen, and, and for example, let's say one of the henchmen turns on the on the master and becomes the, the even more ruthless master. It kind of works that way, because it's a very different stylized type of film. But here, you can't give such an important, overwhelmingly powerful character no backstory at all. Even in the in the books that I've been reading, you know, the visual dictionaries and all that other stuff, it just kind of says that this guy was an opportunist and he really uh, was in the right place at the right time to kind of take over and, and gather the, 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 the First Order. But he really had no real, like, master plan, really. He was just kind of like the right guy in the right place. And we don't get that impression 
from watching him. He was He's not just another guy who happened to take power. He's a very specific guy. So I think he deserves a little more. I think he could have... Uh, again, unless they're saving this for the next film, but we could have seen a little more about how he did take control of Kylo Ren. How he seduced Kylo Ren. And in doing that, whether it's a flashback or something like that, we could introduce... A little more backstory into him you know is he some kind of a leftover imperial individual is he maybe um, some imperial experiment of trying to clone the emperor let's say something as as, as far-fetched as that that kind of went wrong and he did his own thing could he be pre-emperor or you know an even older being than the empire that's here to take over, you know, something. I, I really think they should have given us, they should have thrown us a bone somehow about who he is. Could he be an old disgruntled Jedi? You know, I don't know if you want to go as far as to pin him down to a specific Jedi that we already know. That would be a little too much coincidence. But what if he is a disgruntled Jedi? What if he is kind of like a Dooku type of character? Obviously a different race, so they live longer, and he, there's a legitimate reason for him looking the way he does, you know, being alive all this time. But yeah, that, that, that might be an interesting thing, you know, follow that a little bit. Maybe Yoda tells Luke, that could be Yoda's moment, that, listen, the, the real bad guy here is somebody that, that he failed. You know, another one of, now get this, this would be a very ironic, um, let's say he's a Padawan that Yoda was training before the Jedi Purge, and the big scar you see across his face is something that maybe Anakin did when he went into the Jedi Temple and started killing all the Padawans. Maybe this is a surviving Padawan that nobody knew about, that maybe just Yoda knew about, just like Yoda is trying to hide people left and right as much as possible. This guy grew up, but instead of hiding and, and helping, you know, the Republic or the Jedi, he kind of kept quiet and was biting, you know, waiting for his time uh, to the point where he wanted to now take revenge on the Jedi. He wanted to help exterminate the Jedi, which the Emperor did a very thorough job, by the way. But now he is back and that would explain why does he have so many uh, force powers? You know, you have to explain that the guy has these these force powers, you know, force powers are not very common. You know, they don't just go around everywhere. So where does he learn the force powers? He either learned it from a Jedi or he learned it from a Sith. You know, it's one or the other. So that would be a nice, interesting twist. You know, it's a similar situation now where he's betraying his own order and now he's teaching Kylo Ren to betray his own order. Uh, so, yeah, that's the, there you go. There's a good one for you. Chew on that for a while. Uh, Ray's parents... Uh, again, because you don't want to make every single character connected, and I know we're pushing it a little bit with having Snoke have a connection uh, to the whole big picture, Ray's parents, do we want to make her parents that important? Uh, we don't have to, or we could. There's been speculation, obviously since the first film, that maybe she has something to do with Luke, maybe she has something to do with Solo. Solo is very evasive, and the way that that film was cut, it implies that they're purposely avoiding the subject because they're teasing you about the subject. I would lean more towards Solo, especially the way that these two think alike so much. So what if she is not somebody that Solo uh, knew from for example, she couldn't be a daughter, a second daughter to Han. You know, she could not, she would not be the sister of Kylo Ren because that is repetitive of Star Wars, obviously. Now, granted, the people writing this are not that concerned about being repetitive. They actually want to be repetitive, it seems to me, at times. But it would be a little too much of that. But what if, what if she's a daughter Han never knew from a previous girlfriend? What if uh, he had a fling with some woman, you know? Yeah, but that doesn't really work too well because he would have to have had her. Do we really want Han Solo cheating on Leia? <laughs> right after Return of the Jedi? Uh, well, 30 years have passed and these kids are in their 20s, let's say. So that means 10 years after the Battle of Endor, Han fooled around with some woman or something. Uh... 
do we really want to go the route of maybe she's his niece? He never knew he had a... How do you make a connection between two characters without going the route of the daughter I never knew I had? That's a tough one. Let's skip that for now. The character of Holdo itself is something that I still have to kind of figure out uh, whether or not we need it. But we do need, I think, that jump to hyperspace. That was a cool set piece for the film. It was a cool way of of a last ditch effort. The only thing that I would do is that I wouldn't make it so easy. So for example, one of the regular criticisms of that is that, well, if anybody can turn their ship into a missile, which is nothing out of the ordinary, you know, you like a a kamikaze run into somebody else's uh, vehicle or uh, ship or spaceship, whatever. Why hasn't this been done before? It seems kind of like, yeah, we could do that. You know, if, if in case of emergency, instead of just crashing into somebody, you do that. We've seen ships crash into other ships on purpose or accidentally. But in this particular case, what if it's related to a malfunction? So, for example... Normally, ships wouldn't let you do that. Normally, ships have a safety protocol, let's say, that does not allow you to engage the hyperdrive while you're aiming at another ship. That's just the way they're designed. It's a safety feature. And let's say it's a safety feature that normally you can't just bypass by hitting a button to bypass. And yes, let me go full, you know, suicide mode here and and crash into someone else in that manner. Well... What if the ship is damaged because of all the bombardments? You know, they're getting closer and closer, and then there's the bombardments, and, and all of a sudden, the, the, whatever safety protocol is damaged. And now they are allowed to do that. They are allowed to engage that. That's a possible one. That's a possibility. You know, you could have had this character all through the film, you know, as part of the escape uh, plot line. This passenger could have had a second-in-command that could have been Rose, let's say, for example, and as they evacuate the entire ship, just like before, one person stays behind because they're going to perform this maneuver, and that could be in Haldo. So that is possible. The question is, is there any other way of doing it that is a little more plausible? You know, like I said before, it, it looks good. It's worth keeping, but the reason needs to be a little more solid. Now, the entire Canto Bite sequence is something that I'm still struggling with because I just cannot figure out a way to create a third location for some of our characters to go to to perform something. It would be have to be a creative... And I, I could almost picture, you know, the writers of this film having the same problem and is that, well, you know, we have this, okay, we can handle this, then we have that over there, we can handle that, but... All of a sudden, we have a character with nothing to do. What do we do with Finn? He needs to do something. You know, he's not a pilot, so we can't have him flying around, engaging in ships, really. You know, except at the end with Canto Bight, with everybody's just at their last wits. So we need to create a scenario where some of these guys go on a mission. And if they go on a mission, you know, the characters that we have nothing for them to do, then we can kind of create something where... You know, you have an excuse then to do the the cantina. You know, we haven't we haven't done the cantina in a while. Let's do the cantina scene. You know, let's do an area, a world, a city, a location where all these different alien races are there mingling, and and we get to be you know the fish out of water in between them. You know that sort of thing. So it, it kind of gives them that excuse. It also gives you the excuse to create some kind of relationship between Finn and Rose. You know, you created this new character, and she does have a good connection to her sister that gets killed in the beginning that works really well but then again what do you do with her and you know they figured out or they they planned okay well we'll do is she's the one that knows about this technology finn knows about it a little bit and and she knows how it could pot- potentially work so now we got to hook them up with some other third person to help them sneak in there and that's where we get dj and oh great he can they can meet dj at this planet because that's where they're gonna meet you know okay i i get how that m- might have happened But I am still not content with that story because, again, it does not accomplish anything. It doesn't work. Nothing gets accomplished except it places characters in places where you want them to be later or it gives them something to do while the rest of the story is moving along. So that is something that I think needs a little more examination. Let me go back a a little here and go back to the Luke climax. One of the things that should have been thrown around, I guess, is the idea of not necessarily killing off Luke at the end of this film. You would 
figure, and, and it kind of makes not sense, but I understand their pattern here of each film, you would kind of give a goodbye to each individual character. The first one being Han Solo, obviously, he was the first one to go. And the one that's most likely understandable because of the fact that he had such a long track record, the actor Harrison Ford, of saying that he wanted his character to uh, possibly have been killed off in the second film. And it kind of felt that way, to me at least, and to a lot of fans, I believe, that once we got to The Force Awakens, it was inevitable that he was going to die because of the fact that he wanted out, even though you're not going to find a quote that says anything related to this film of him wanting out. But I don't know. You kind of see the writing on the wall here from all this previous, you know, previous uh, story descriptions of, of what happened after Jedi. And the many other books have reported on that. And just this general attitude in general. So whether the writers liked it or not, it looked as if he was going to be the first one to leave this trilogy. This is how they were going to start getting rid of these main characters. And so-called passing the torch to the new characters. So, okay, film one is Han Solo. Film two, they decided, would be Luke. And this is the decision they made even before they obviously knew of the death of Carrie Fisher, obviously. The plan was to have her be the last one, whether she would live or die, unknown, just completely unknown. And the fact that Luke was then chosen to be the second one to be killed off in such a, what a lot of people, you know, including myself to a certain extent, think a very unceremonial manner, a very un like manner. Mark Hamill has given interviews very recently talking about how this is just not his character. This His character is just not the person that he envisioned all these years that he's been living with. This is not the kind of end that you would have. And this is not the kind of storytelling that he envisioned either. This is not the heroic acts and life and even death of a Luke Skywalker. The closest I can think about uh, the reaction and, and the rightful reaction is when they decided to kill off Captain Kirk in Generations, Star Trek Generations. I remember a lot of fans, again, including myself, felt that it was a very weak death. It was a very insignificant kind of death, but not very epic kind of death, if you will, for a, again, this isn't reality. This isn't, and, in, and you know, in reality, you don't have these cinematic deaths. You don't have these cinematic endings most of the times. Most of the times are very insignificant, out of place, unexpected, or, expect, you know, or, or somewhat expected, but that's reality. This is film. So for film, especially a space fantasy, you know, again, this doesn't claim to be anything too realistic. It might, you know, use the backdrop or the story beats of, a re of realistic events, let's say. But the way that these events are depicted are very fantastical. You know, Luke's death was not very fantastical. The fact that he was a grumpy old man up, up until the last 20 seconds of the film, <laughs> pretty much, you know, leads you to believe that, my God, we just wasted a whole film, you know, on Luke. So one idea is to, you're taking another pass at this script, and guess what? Let's, let's not get rid of Luke in this episode. Let's save him for episode nine. So here you have the opportunity to maybe... You know, if you wanted to go that far, do you really have to kill every character to pass the torch? Can't some characters just live into old age? You know, is there something wrong with that? Not all of them, but, I mean, you already got rid of Han Solo, a very important character. Couldn't Leia and Luke live into old age? Is that a possibility? Maybe yes, maybe no. Well, you know, Leia doesn't have to come out of this triumphant, and Luke doesn't have to come out of this triumphant. Both of them don't have to be the, the super superheroes of this particular chapter. But what if you don't get rid of Luke? What if you, for example, as I mentioned earlier, let's reverse the fight in terms of the projection versus the real. Why don't we start off with Luke coming out to meet the Adats in Crate, and it is the real Luke. It is old Luke. But surprise, he has obviously the green lightsaber, let's say. And he does some really, really, really crazy stuff, you know, with his force powers. This is kind of like a prequel era uh, Jedi, 
you know, he has these, he can do these fantastic leaps. He can take on full blown ad ads, let's say. Enough to just at least slow them down a bit to the point where these guys are starting to get a little worried. And that is what forces Kylo to come out because Luke is challenging Kylo and Kylo cannot resist, you know, the opportunity to, to just take care of him himself. But at this point, Luke has kind of disappeared, let's say, after a huge barrage of firepower, you know, a lot of smoke, and Luke is still there. Uh, but guess what? Now it's projection Luke, and Luke is now working his way back towards the caves, and he's projecting, and, you know, he's suffering through the projection. I can, you know, we can continue that. And, you know, they go through that whole dance where Kylo is enraged by what's happening to a certain point where, you know, he realizes that he is actually hitting Luke and nothing's happening to him, you know, kind of like in the movie. And then at that point, Luke ends the projection and he is, you know, another person that is able to, by the time the projection ends, he is able to escape out of the back of the cave, you know, to the waiting Falcon with Ray and Chewie and everybody else, you know, by the end. This way you are able to save both characters, Leia and Luke. Leia could have also remained in a coma for the rest of this film up until the end. You know, Luke saved her, but she didn't really come out of it. So not that it would help you in the next film for the fact that she's not around, period. You know, does it help you in killing her off because of her injuries? Possibly, but not necessarily. Especially since in this film, she does recover from her injuries, more or less, and is able to provide guidance. Another topic that you know, I was thinking about in terms of, you know, when I was talking about the chase and how we can break the chase into sections, into different hyperspace jumps, which would give us the ability to go visit other planets, other locations as the chase continues. I'd like the idea of, for example, during the secondary jump. So as I said earlier, the first jump, uh, you know, the first time it's a space battle, it's a dogfight in space generic space like we have in most films second jump we are now at a atmospheric level so because it's an atmospheric level things are a little slower because they're dodging canyons let's say these canyons are big enough that the larger ships can actually maneuver through them but they have to go a little slower the smaller ships can still kind of dogfight and and kind of chase each other a little more but because of that fact that they're going slower i would say that before they reach those lower levels of the canyons we already have as they're descending into these canyons we can have the first order send out breaching pods to the larger resistance ships and this gives you the opportunity to create some new type of troopers, which is something that's very exciting whenever you have a new Star Wars film is how, you know, will they come up with some kind of new trooper that we could, uh, you know, watch. And this would be a good opportunity for Finn to be able to have his moment in this film rather than in Canto Bite, have this moment. Because what would happen is, for example, you have, let's say Finn is still in a medical ship because he's still coming out of his coma. And as the first jump takes place, he is coming out of his coma and he's adjusting to, uh, you know, waking up and, and, you know, he's getting dressed and that sort of thing. And let's say that the medical assistant to him is a young Rose, younger than this actress, I would even say. I would make her a little younger because she would have to be kind of like a newbie training how to perform medical procedures and she's just kind of keeping an eye on him. But while this is happening and they perform this jump, all of a sudden the warning goes through the ship that there are breaching pods attaching to the ship. So as people are fighting off these I don't know if you want to call them space troopers, because they did have this. This was the original idea, from what I understand, on A New Hope, was that the attack on the Rebel Blockade Runner was supposed to be a space jump kind of attack, where the stormtroopers are jumping from one ship to the other in 
in space and they're breaching, you know, they're all wearing all this gear. And that is one of the inspirations for why, you know, Vader and the troopers look the way they look originally was because they wanted them to look as if they were able to breathe in space to be able to go from one ship to the other. That's why they had all these hoses and breathing apparatuses and masks and stuff like that. Uh, it was supposed to be a, you know, like an astronaut suit, more or less. Well, this would have been a great way to, I think, bring it to this trilogy or to this film specifically. You know, it's a callback to a, a, an unused concept from A New Hope. So in the story, what you could have is, you know, while people are engaging, you know, the incoming troopers, you kind of get the feel that little by little, they're kind of losing the fight. Because this is, after all, a medical ship. Not a lot of people are trained soldiers, so they're kind of just escaping. They're kind of working their way towards the escape pods. And Finn, you know, because he used to be a trooper, he kind of has some uh, knowledge of their techniques and their battle movements and that sort of thing. So he's able to kind of slow them down a little bit more than your average person in the ship with the assistance of Rose, you know, this, this medical person that's kind of taking care of him. And, you know, we get to the point where those two are able to finally help eject many, many more people in larger pods so that those escape pods can then jettison off of this ship and go off into another ship. You know, they can kind of escape to another ship while, while this is happening. And, and he's able to do that, too, you know, at the last minute, the last second. And just as he's leaving, you know, his ship starts to come apart, you know, because it's so heavily damaged and and all the firefights inside. So that gives you, again, a little bit of something for Finn to do that is specific to his talent, let's say. And his talent is he was an ex-trooper. He was an ex-stormtrooper. With Rose, I would kind of strip away the romantic element that we get towards the end of her, you know, time with Finn. Because I would make her younger, I would make her more of a, instead of a romantic interest, it's a professional or like, an, a, like a, a mentor, you know, she's a fan. We know that she's a fan of Finn, you know, the history of Finn, the, the fact that he's a defector and that sort of thing. But she still can have the connection to her sister. That, that, that works. That still works. That's still a good thing to have. But because she is younger, I would kind of steer away from that. By the end, you could almost hint that she maybe has a crush on him, but not to the extent that we see it here in The Last Jedi. I wouldn't push that crush that far to the extent that she has to give him a kiss and all of a sudden you're like, oh boy, now we're in trouble. Now what do we do with these two now? Because, you know, I, I don't want to step over the line too much into the relationship that we believe we have you know, between Ray and Finn that was established in the first film. I don't want to make it that obvious that we're injecting a love triangle here. We're injecting a, oh boy, here we go. Now he has two girls he's, you know, involved with. One that he's after and one that's after him. As I mentioned, that first battle, you know, after the first jump, I would make it a more traditional one, space battle, uh, something like what we've seen in other Star Wars films, Return of the Jedi, for example, where you have a fast-paced battle near the Death Star 2, you know, large ships engaging large ships and small ships and making, or the Battle of Coruscant, where, granted, you are near Coruscant, but the kind of dynamic movements that you see, we are more familiar with in terms of how you do handle large and small sized ships going after each other in, in, in an area. So, you know, it is possible. It's been done before. It is cinematic and it is exciting. And like I mentioned earlier, is that the third jump, I would just make it a nebula, space nebula. You go for the Star Trek II Wrath of Khan feel of being in a nebula where you really can't see too much. And again, by this point, every jump, they're figuring it out that it's not working. Something's wrong. By the second jump, they know they're being tracked. We can keep the whole mythology of the tracking technology. Now, this is something that, you know, once you get the genie out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. So I don't think it's kind of like a Death Star or kind of like Starkiller Planet. I don't think it's a technology that once you blow it up, they can't reuse it again. But, you know, obvious, you know, with Star Wars, they used the Death Star twice and they even brought it forward to this movie. So let's assume now that this hyperspace, uh, hyper jump uh, drive tracking is something that exists. We could kind of assume that this is something we're going to be kind of stuck with now, okay? Unless they can figure out a counter 
measure to it. I mean, they could always, it's science fiction. You can always countermeasure everything. You know, it's, it's what you do. So at this point, I would have it so that during this third final battle before we reach Crate, this is where Haldo, Admiral Haldo, let's say, who, here's another idea to throw out there. Let's say Haldo is an old trainer of Poe. Maybe she was his mentor of, you know, maybe she taught him how to be a pilot. Maybe she was the, the, the person that was training all the pilots and that's how Poe learned to fly a ship or something like that. How he got his training from the resistance from Haldo, let's say. Let's not make them adversarial characters. Let's not put him in conflict right away, but let's give him an, an emotional reason that would hurt him to lose her. Not a romantic one. I mean, we don't want too many romantic things going on here at the same time. Everybody doesn't have to be in a romantic relationship with someone else. We already have certain characters that are kind of tied to each other. So let's not do that. Finn is already that person that we're kind of looking at when it comes to romantic interest. Poe, let's make him more of a mentor. He's losing like a father figure, or in this case, a mother figure. And you could have it uh, so that... You know, as we are slowly losing more ships, you know, we, we, we're still in that mode of losing ships, losing ships, losing ships, losing people. We get to the point where that's it. We have to do something now because at this rate, we are out of options. And the only thing left we can do now is get to that planet that's down there. So to kind of slow things down a little bit more, this is where, you know, how those ships gets damaged let's say. And as a result of this damage, whatever safety mechanisms the ship has uh, so that you don't purposely perform a hyperspace jump into a solid object, we all realize that, guess what? We can do that now. So she orders the evacuation of her ship. She stays behind like she does now. And she performs that maneuver where it slows them all down. And it even stops the tracking because they're able to hurt the ship and by hurting the 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 supremacy the the lead ship you know snoke's ship that also ties in with how ray is able to escape that ship too it gives her that chance forget about finn and everybody else being in there they have to escape too because they're never there in the first place they didn't have to go there they're not there period wonderful great love it but it at least gets ray out of there it allows her to get out of that section and bring her back to crate Another variation on this idea is that, forget Haldo, let's make it Admiral Akbar. If we are dead set on killing Admiral Akbar, let him have the heroic death. Let him be the one that sacrifices himself to let everybody else escape, which would make it a more emotional kind of thing. And it also kind of works if you want to make him pose mentor. So that works great too, I think. Or you can just keep Akbar. He doesn't have to die. He can save him for the next film. He, he's one of the ones that gets away in, in one of his ships. He's able to land his ship. But, you know, let's go in that direction. So, you know, th there are possibilities here. There are many, many possibilities here where one more pass at this script, I think, could have made this a much, much better film without, again, disrupting the overall idea of what are the main things going on here that you wanted to complete? Like I said earlier, you know, yes, one option is to completely scrap it and start from scratch, change the story 100%. But I don't think that's necessary. Just like we've seen on that video that I mentioned before, that just by changing a little bit of the editing, you know, you could have had a completely different feel. There are so many little things here that would have to be worked out, obviously, and I went through a lot of them in terms of what has to be removed. And, and yes, it's not just a matter of editing here. This is the, what I'm talking about is, is a, it's a restructuring. A lot of it could be done through editing, but a lot of it would have had to been shot differently. And like I said about a million times already, this kind of analyzing, this kind of nitpicky what-if conversations is nothing new. We've been doing this all along. Yes, there are people that take this too far, and they are currently taking it a little too far. Plus, in the past, because of this current toxic kind of environment that we're in, even Lucasfilm, some of the people at Lucasfilm are not even taking any of this criticism or any of these ideas like they would in the past. In the past, you would kind of react by saying, you know, uh, that's some great ideas, guys. Thanks for thinking about it. You know, we'll... Well, hopefully the next film, you know, we'll, we'll have some surprises for you. They're always, you always just have to take a, a neutral stance uh, when people were being respectfully 
you know, critical or throwing ideas around or what if, you know, that kind of conversations. Now, again, because of this environment that we're in, they seem to be taking a harsher, uh, more direct anti-fan uh, reaction by some of the creators, uh, people like even Ryan Johnson. You figure, you know, he's the guy, you know, that's in charge of, of this last film that we saw, not Solo, but The Last Jedi. And, you know, he doesn't seem to be holding back too much at times. Again, I'll say it again, you know, for a film that they claim is such a target hit, they, they did exactly what they wanted to do, they, the result was exactly how they wanted to do, you cannot just dismiss people that are unhappy with the story as them being haters. You can't just throw the ball in that same bucket. We've talked about this before, that they're, they're in that bucket, you can separate the fans that are critical from the you know, crazier, you know, trolling, trolling haters, you know, that are always there. They've always been there. There's always going to be a contingency of angry, you know, people that you can't please no matter what. But from the Lucasfilm side, you can't really treat them all as the same. For a film, like I said, that is, that they, they like to put out the story that they're so happy with. I have never seen a director being out there so much during the film, after the film, during the DVD, after the DVD release, you know, kind of trying to tap dance, you know, his decisions, uh, you know, justifying them. So I, I'm pretty sure that behind the scenes, they are trying to figure out which way to go. We've heard stories that all these future movies, uh, standalones are on hold now. And then there were stories going around that they're not on hold. It's true. It's not true. Certain, you know, they're re-evaluating everything. So we will see which way it goes. And this is not going to stop regular fans, I think, in the future from trying to come up with ideas. We know this isn't going to happen, but as an exercise in writing, as an exercise in storytelling, yes, it is possible. You don't have to be a, a genius writer. You don't have to even be George Lucas. Just a regular person can kind of say, all right, how could we make this a little better? What would you change in the story, you know, to make it make a little more sense? And these type of little things, I think, could have made a difference, at least for some of us. All right. I hope everybody enjoyed today's show. We dove pretty deep, as deep as we possibly can, into possible rewrites into The Last Jedi. Again, this is a thing we do all the time as fans of films, not as haters of films, but, you know, we've been trying to theorize on how to improve certain things. You know, we used to talk about not only in the original trilogy, we would think about weak points in the trilogy and try to see, well, if this would have been done differently, then that would have been done differently. And then this, this might have worked a little better. Same thing with the prequels. The prequels had a lot of points that were arguably <laughs> could have used some rewrites. And here we go again. We have it with the new trilogy, especially, especially The Last Jedi. I don't care how you slice it. Whether it is your favorite film of all time, you cannot deny the backlash and the controversy surrounding the decision of certain story plots and character developments that were done that seem to have affected, you know, the fan community. Once again, if you strip away the outliers, the extremes, the, the haters, you're still left with some legitimate, legitimate complaints that uh, could have been worked out. And this is just theory, as usual, theory. We are going to move on to the next film, see what happens there. With Abrams directing the last one, more or less the entire cast has been announced. We know Mark Hamill is coming back. We know Carrie Fisher is going to be somehow used from previous scenes uh, from the other two films. We don't know exactly how Mark Hamill will <laughs> appear, whether he will be a Force ghost or maybe they have something else in mind where he actually does revive. I don't know, but we are going to find out hopefully in about a year and a half. So on behalf of everybody here, thanks for listening, and we will see you here next time at GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. And I think it's just because the attitude of tossing on the go worked really well. So it's, 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 uh, it's still keeping that kind of like... Well, see, again, I mean, and I told Brian this, it's no surprise. I said, I just fundamentally disagree with 
your concept of this character and how you use him. Now, having said that, I'll do everything within my power to realize your vision. Because, you know, it's not my character to, to decide. It belongs to other people. They just rent it out to me. Mark, very understandably, wasn't thrilled about some of the choices in the script. The big things being the place that Luke's head is at, the fact that he's not the Luke Skywalker that we knew, and, frankly, the fact that he dies at the end. It's heavy on him. He thought he's going to be the Luke Skywalker of this trilogy. It's just the realization that in this trilogy he's not Luke Skywalker, he's Obi. Well, I thought of what's happening today. I thought, yeah. well, what if I don't? <laughs> I keep popping up. <laughs> you know, just have to reach it. I know. Yeah, Within seconds, they'll just conk <laughs> me on the head. Stay down, punk. <laughs> the scene that we can't know its name. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The scene that dare not speak its name. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. I'm going to make them sorry they ever came up with that idea. I don't think he ever got to the point where he thought, okay, I, I understand why Luke has to go at the end of this. But he was completely devoted to making what I had written the most powerful version it can possibly be on the screen. It's an interesting thing because, you know, you have your own view of how your character should be and how he should be utilized. My character always represented hope and optimism. And now here I am very pessimistic and disillusioned and sort of demoralized. No matter how this comes out, if I'm wonderful, it's because of him. And if it's terrible, it's also his fault. If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2018. <laughs>